Hello, and welcome to Ray Tracing in a Weekend in just a few hours. Dr. Peter Shirley, a distinguished scientist at NVIDIA and an adjunct professor of computer science at the University of Utah, wrote the extraordinary ebook Ray Tracing in a Weekend in 2018. I stumbled upon it last year, and despite my lack of prior knowledge in the field of ray tracing, was captivated. It took me a bit longer than a weekend to complete, but I embraced the challenge until I achieved a genuine grasp of the subject matter. In this video series, I strive to share and elucidate these concepts. I pretty much follow along with the book, though there are some sections I skip over and some code listings I make my own. Fret not, it all comes together in the end. Let's start by delving into the world of the PPM image format, a versatile means of storing colorful images. The acronym PPM stands for Portable PixMap Format. P3 serves as the initial identifier, and following this, the format signifies the image's dimensions by stating its width, the number of pixels horizontally, and height, the number of pixels vertically. Additionally, the format designates the maximum value for each color component of a pixel, which is conventionally set to 255. A pixel itself is represented by a triplet, three numbers ranging from zero to the aforementioned maximum value. These numbers correspond to the intensity levels of red, green, and blue, respectively. To define the image's content, the pixels are arranged in rows from left to right, and the rows progress from top to bottom. Here we have six pixels, three pixels per row in two rows. In the initial code listing, we embark on the creation of a PPM image. First, we write P3 to the output, followed by the width and height of the image, and then the maximum value for a color component. It's important to note that our program directs the image output to the standard output stream, Cout. However, additional debug output, such as the progress indicator, is redirected to the error output stream, Cair. To output our pixels, we utilize a nested loop. The outer loop, J, iterates from 255 down to 0, while the inner loop, I, progresses from 0 to 255. During each iteration, an RGB triplet is produced. Dr. Shirley emphasizes that conventionally, the red-green-blue components range from 0 to 1. Consequently, for the first pixel, with J at 255 and I at 0, we observe that R will be 0, while G will be 1. B is constant at 0.25. As a result, we anticipate this pixel to be predominantly green with a hint of blue. As we proceed to the last pixel in the top row, R will be 1, while G will remain at 1. Given that red and green light combine to form yellow, we can expect this pixel to assume a yellow hue. Upon reaching the bottom row, J will be 0. Consequently, the initial pixel on the bottom row will exhibit red and green components of 0. Accompanied by a blue value of 0.25, this pixel should appear as a dark shade of blue. In contrast, the last pixel on this row will possess a green component of 0 and a red component of 1, resulting in a red coloration with that hint of blue. We cast our components from the 0, 1 range to an integer from 0 to 255. Casting will truncate the value, which is why we multiply by 255.999 rather than just 255. Let's run this code and generate our image. We'll build using CMake, as Dr. Shirley does. CMake is a makefile generator. I've installed CMake and included this file cmakelists.txt. It specifies the name of our project, the version of C++ we're using, the name of the executable, and the file we're building. There is a one-time setup to specify a build directory. Then we can build the project, run it, redirecting the output to a file, and then we can open that file. Let's take a look at our image. We see our four colors in the corners as expected. Opening the image file in the IDE, we can see that there are a lot of pixels, 256 squared to be exact. Now check this out. If we change our dimensions to say 4x4, four four, look at the output. Obviously, it's far fewer pixels. 
but the underlying image is in fact the same. Same four colors in the corners, just fewer steps to go from one to another. Before we get into anything else, we need to talk about geometric vectors. Dr. Shirley describes them in a class he calls VEC3. The class defines a data member called E, which stores three elements in an array, which we initialize with these constructor initializer lists. The class includes some methods to perform assignment operator overloading, as well as for calculating length. One thing to note is we return a reference and not just a value for these overloads. That's because the value we'd be returning would be a temporary object, which has a specific meaning in C++, and we wouldn't be able to do any chaining with these operators. Not that we will be, but still. He also writes some utility functions that take VEC3 objects as arguments, such as for calculating the dot and cross products. We also add the aliases color and point three, because many operations are the same for points, colors, and VEC3s, like initialization, addition, etc. We'll also factor out how we write our pixel to the screen with the utility function called writeColor that uses the VEC3 class. To quote Dr. Shirley, we're now ready to turn the corner and make a ray tracer. The ray tracer sends rays through pixels and computes a color based on that ray. What exactly are the units from one point to the next? They aren't pixels. They're simply virtual or relative units. To start, we'll create a vector from the point 000, 000 to points in our virtual viewport. And based on that vector, we will output a red, green, blue triplet, that is, a pixel. We start at a point on the top left corner and move across, each step creating another pixel. So, if our image is 400 pixels wide, it'll take 400 steps. If it's 10 pixels wide, it'll take 10 steps. In any case, we move from top left to top right, and then from top to bottom, same as before. With a vector from 0, 0, 0 to a point on the viewport, we normalize it using a utility function in VEC3 and find the Y component. Note that the Y component can be anywhere from 1 to minus 1, though we won't see those actual two values in this example as 1 means it's pointing straight up and minus 1 means straight down. So we'll add 1 to it to ensure it's above 0, then multiply by 0.5 to get a number between 0 and 1. We'll call this number T and we'll create a pixel with this formula, color 111 being white and 0.5.71 being a shade of blue. So as T gets closer to 1, it'll be more blue, and closer to 0, it'll be more white. The Y component of a unit vector pointing here will be the most positive, and here will be the most negative. Let's take a look at the code we're going to use. Dr. Shirley introduces a ray class in his listing. We'll do that after this. Our code defines an aspect ratio, and then the width, 400 pixels, and height, which works out to 225 pixels. We then define a virtual viewport height of two units. This will make the viewport width 3.555 repeated units. The focal length is the distance from our origin to the viewport. In our case, it's one unit. And to be sure, using the right-hand rule, the viewport is in the negative z direction. We find the location of the lower left corner, and then start making vectors to points on the viewport. Looking at the code, for the first point, u will be 0 and v will be 1. So the first point will be in the top left corner. We subtract the origin to get our vector. We technically don't have to because it's at 0, 0, 0. We'll put it in here for when we move it to another point. And then we find the color like we talked about and write the pixel. Here is what we get. And you can see the most blue and most white pixels in the image. I also think it's instructive to see what happens when we make the image 16 pixels wide, being 9 pixels high. As you can see, it's the same underlying image. We'll add our first object to our virtual world, a sphere. 
We'll draw our axes following the right hand rule as we did before, just rotate it a bit. Z axis across, the Y axis on top, and the X axis going out of the page. The previous drawing had the camera, point A, at the origin. I moved it to some other point to generalize. We'll call the graph origin O. We have our sphere centered at point C with radius R, and we'll draw the virtual viewport. These ticks represent the top and bottom of the viewport. And here are our vectors from the camera origin to points on the viewport, one for each pixel, just as before. And so what's known here? The vector A is, as is the vector C. We will call a vector from the camera to the viewport B. We don't know the vector RP from the sphere center to a potential intersection point P, but we do know what its length would be, that is, the radius. Here are our known quantities. If there were an intersection along vector B, it would be TB, T just being some real number. So for every vector from our camera origin to the viewport, we just need to see if there's some real T. If so, that vector intersects the sphere. We need to see if there's a real T for this equation. We can rearrange and write A minus C as OC as Dr. Shirley does. We don't know RP, but if this equation is true, it means their lengths and the square of their lengths are the same. We'll use the dot product to get the square of the lengths and rearrange. We now have a quadratic equation and can solve for t. For now, we'll just determine if t is real. If it is, we'll write out a red pixel for that vector. Otherwise, it will be business as usual, and the picture will be some shade of blue. Here's the code. The function hit sphere takes four arguments, the sphere center, the radius, the camera origin, and the current vector, and returns true if that t value is real just as we discussed. If it is, we'll make the pixel red. It's hard to see, but here is the entire listing. Let's run it. It's also worth noting, as Dr. Shirley does, that if we move the center behind the camera, we get the same result. That's because the value t is still real. It's just negative. We'll fix that. But before we do, let's run it again with the width to 16 pixels and see again our underlying image. Here's the updated hit sphere code. We now return a double, that t value. If the discriminant is less than zero, we return a negative number. Otherwise, we return the lesser t value. Remember, there are two t values as a result of the quadratic formula. We then check if t is above zero and go from there. If it's negative, it's because the discriminant is less than zero or because t is less than zero. In either case, we won't make that pixel red. We can do better than just making the pixel red. We will shade it based on a surface normal. Since we know our t value, we can find our point p that is, the intersection between a vector from our camera to the viewport and the sphere. If the vector from the camera to the viewport is B, then our point P is A plus TB. And since we know the sphere center C, the normal is just P minus C, or A plus TB minus C. To actually color the pixel, Dr. Shirley explains a common trick used for visualizing normals which is to normalize the normal, that is, make it a unit length and map each component, x, y, and z, to red, green, and blue. If we look at our sphere from the point of view of the camera origin, with x and y axes here, 
and Z going out of the page, this is what we'll see. And here are some normals. Larger X will mean more red. Larger Y will mean more green. The largest Z will be right in the middle, but it'll never be too small anywhere because that would mean a normal pointing away from the camera. And so we can expect the reddish shading will be where X is large, but Y is small, around here. And greenest where Y is large and X is small. When both X and Y are small, it will be dominated by blue, which we can expect here. And when X and Y are larger, it will be whitest here. Here's the code. We find our point P and the normal, and then normalize the normal. This unit vector's components range from minus 1 to 1, and so we add 1 to them so they range from 0 to 2, then multiply by 0 0.5 to make them range from 0 to 1, as we did earlier. Let's run the code to see what it produces. We see that it's pretty bluish, but it's reddest here, greenest here, darkest and bluest here, and whitest here. If you follow along with Dr. Shirley's code, you'll notice the use of array class. We haven't used it. Let's refactor our code so we can use it. Here's what the array class looks like. It holds two data members, an origin and a direction, and has a function at that returns a point from the origin along the direction multiplied by a double t. Get color and hit sphere now look like this. Note the ray r. And our main loop looks like this. Dr. Shirley also notes we can simplify the hit sphere function by removing a few multiplications. Dr. Shirley now asks, how about several spheres? Let's take a look at how we're going to approach it. We have our B vector from the camera origin to the viewport, same as before. What we'll do, though, is see if there's an intersection for each sphere. In this example, there's indeed an intersection for each. There's a T1, and so there's a P1 and N1, as well as a T2, with its P2 and N2. However, we only care about the sphere that's closest to the camera origin. This is the most important thing. We only care about the sphere with the smallest t value. All we have to do is keep track of the t value for each intersection. In other words, we have a range from 0 to some t max. At first, t max will be infinity. And as Dr. Shirley puts it, a hit only counts if t is in the range. We'll update this t max each time we find a smaller value. Each time we find a smaller t max, we calculate p and n. And when we're done iterating through the loop, we'll pass those values back, grouped together in a structure Dr. Shirley calls a hit record. At this point, it's business as usual. We'll color the pixel based on the normal that's passed back. So how do we go about coding this? He states, while it's tempting to have an array of spheres, a very clean solution is to make an abstract class for anything array might hit, and make both a sphere and a list of spheres just something you can hit. We'll get to that very clean solution, but first I want to give in to the temptation and see about this array of spheres. We'll create a sphere class with data members for the center and the radius. It has a function hit that should look somewhat familiar. The first part calculates t as we did in hit sphere. However, this function returns a boolean. We pass in the values that make a range, t min is 0, and will return true if t is in range and false otherwise. The function also takes an output parameter. An output parameter is like any other variable, but it's used to return a value. This output parameter is a hit record. Hit record is just a struct that contains the t, p, and n values. Before returning true, we update the output parameter. What about the array of spheres? We can't use the C++ built-in type array, as these are not dynamic, 
You can't push or pop a C++ array. That's what the C++ vector class is for, a dynamic array. Don't confuse C++ vectors with our own VEC3 class. Our sphere list class has a data member objects that is the dynamic array of spheres. We can add and clear out this dynamic array, and it also has a function hit with the same signature as the previous sphere hit function that loops through the dynamic array, updating that max t value each time we get a valid hit. Note it also takes an output parameter. And it's from the output parameter passed back from the sphere where we update the current t max slash closest t value. Finally, and I know it's kind of hard to see here, we instantiate a sphere list called world and add two spheres, a smaller one and a larger one below it. We rename get color to ray color, which now takes the ray and the world slash list object, and it's in this function where we instantiate a hit record and kick things off by setting the initial range between zero and infinity. From there, it's business as usual, with the hit shaded based on the normal of the closest sphere passed back from the output parameter. We also add a new file where for now we just define infinity. Let's run this code and see what happens. We see our two spheres, one in front of the other. The lower sphere is greenish, since the normals from its intersections have a larger y component. I hope this is all making some sense. To recap, we're sending rays into the viewport. Each ray will produce a pixel. If we intersect with an object, the pixel will be colored according to a normal. If we don't intersect with an object, we just color the pixel based on the Y component of the ray. Stay tuned for part two, and please subscribe.